welcome to today's event on advancing sexual and reproductive health and rights for climate change adaptation and resilience, brought together by IPPF, ARO and DFPA. Thank you to everyone joining us today, to those here in Glasgow and those tuning in online from around the world. My name is Emily Vernal and I'm a member of the UNFPA's Joint Youth Working Group on Sexual Reproductive Health Rights and Climate Change Adaptation, as well as the Youth Advisory Group to the CEO of the Global Centre on Adaptation. Both these ro roles uniting these issues around sexual reproductive health rights and climate change adaptation. I am delighted to be moderating today's session which is amplifying such an important and under-discussed nexus issue. Climate change, gender equality, and sexual and reproductive health and rights are inextricably linked. Yet these issues, these issues and discussions rarely occur in the same spaces, despite the ever-growing evidence showing that they should be integrated in our solutions to the climate emergency. SRHR must be considered as a key component of climate adaptation and resilience action, and of climate justice. In recognition of Adaptation Action Day today and tomorrow's Gender Thematic Day, there is no better time to be having this discussion and bringing together a fantastic panel of women who have been working on advancing this nexus from research to programming to policy to youth leadership. These amazing women will set the tone for today's event by centering and providing a platform for women's voices and feminist solutions within the climate emergency and within COP26, recognizing that women and girls are often the first on the front lines of the climate crisis and suffer a disproportionate risk to securing equality, rights and health. So without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce you to today's panelists. Today we're going to hear from Dr. Heather McMillan, a lecturer at Queen Mary's University, Mara Dolan, Program and Advocacy Associate at the Women's Environment and Development Organization, We Do, Zainab Yunusa, Youth Movements and Campaigns Coordinator at Plan International, Mia Nielsen, Program Director, Oh, International Project Officer for the Danish Family Planning Association and BIPU, Program Director on the Asian Pacific Resource and Research Centre for Women, ARO. So to set the scene for today's event, we're going to begin with a short video from IPPF calling for SRHR to be recognised as, as essential to climate change adaptation and resilience. So if we could please have the video. <laughs> Climate crisis is underpinned by grave injustice. The countries most affected by the climate crisis are those least responsible for contributing to it. IPPF's vision is of a world where all people are free to make choices about their sexuality and well-being without discrimination. That vision is threatened by the climate crisis. The list of impacts of this intersection is devastatingly extensive. Limited access to services like contraception, safe abortion care, and STI testing and treatment. Reduced access to safe water during pregnancy and childbirth increased sexual and gender-based violence, and general neglect of the health and rights of people who typically face marginalization. Our humanitarian action responds to the needs of women and girls in emergencies all around the globe. In April 2020, Tropical Cyclone Herald, a Category 5 cyclone, made landfall in Vanuatu before passing through Fiji and Tonga. IPPF's local member associations responded, reaching a total of 4,698 beneficiaries across the three countries with sexual and reproductive health care. Kiribati, a tiny atoll in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, is extremely vulnerable to the effects of the climate crisis. 
humanitarian youth clubs created by IPPF's member association design disaster plans for the community, focusing on women and marginalized groups in emergencies. In March 2019, Cyclone Ida hit Mozambique, resulting in widespread destruction of houses, hospitals, schools, roads, electricity, and water sources. IPPF's member association was quick to respond with life-saving sexual and reproductive health care through mobile outreach to the displacement camps. A total of 9,983 beneficiaries were reached by a team of 42 volunteers and staff members. IPPF is placing human rights, gender equality, and the rights of women, girls, and marginalized groups impacted by the climate crisis at the center of our efforts to address the climate crisis. We are calling on governments and other external stakeholders to do the same. Sexual and reproductive health and rights should be recognized as an essential element of climate change adaptation and resilience. Sexual and reproductive health and rights are critical for advancing gender equality, health and well-being and for overcoming marginalization. They are critical for strengthening individuals and communities' resilience and capacity to adapt to the climate crisis. There is no doubt that the climate crisis is one of the key challenges of our time. Our planet is in a state of emergency. The time to act for women and girls is now. I would just like to thank the IPPF for putting together that video today and for championing, championing this vision for a right-centered adaptation agenda. So I'd now like to invite Dr. Heather McMillan to take the floor, who will take a deep dive into these interlinkages between SRHR and the climate change adaptation agenda. And her expertise will help contextualize today's conversation. Heather is leading on a partnership between Queen Mary's University and the UNFPA, exploring the intersection between climate change and SRHR, as part of which she was the lead author of a report reviewing inclusion of SRHR in national climate policy, which was released by the UNFPA in July 2021. So Heather, over to you. Thanks very much. Hi, everyone. And um, thank you for having me today. So at the most fundamental level, people need control over their bodies to respond, respond and adapt to climate change. And sexual and reproductive rights, health and justice has not yet received the attention and focus that it deserves in climate change policy. But it underpins so many of the changes that we know that we need to make and so many of the adaptations that are um, in store for us. So bodily autonomy is a right in and of itself, but it takes on even more urgency in the face of an unpredictable and changing climate. Women and girls are frequently described as a group that is especially vulnerable to climate change, but we have to remind ourselves that actually women and girls, people with diverse sexual orientations and gender identities and others are actually made vulnerable uh, by structures and systems that regularly discriminate against them and interlock to oppress us. SRHR is a really good barometer of how well a society is doing in upholding rights and justice, yet it's frequently neglected in all domains. And these issues that, under, that, that, are, that sexual and reproductive rights and health are comprised of, you know, sex, family formation, birth, infertility, freedom from violence, health, satisfaction, pleasure, you know, these sit at the most intimate and universal and fundamental experiences of life yet they're usually heavily stigmatized, lack funding, focus, and meaningful inclusion in all kinds of policy domains, but also including um, climate change policy. They also tend to lack serious political will. So that said, um, what are some of the intersections and what is the state of the evidence on how these important domains come together? 
So we know that um, climate change worsens maternal and neonatal health outcomes. It does that directly and indirectly. So increases in heat and air pollution, um, as well as disruptions to services, impacts on maternal nutrition, um, salinated water, all come together to create poor maternal health outcomes and poor neonatal health outcomes. And the, the data on that is steadily emerging. We also know that climate change results in increases in gender-based violence. We see this in times of stress and scarcity. Numerous uh, women human rights defenders have been you know, attacked, murdered, and assaulted uh, for defending environmental commons. Uh, we see all of the impacts that humanitarian crises bring and the, the increases that they bring as well on violence. We also know that climate change exacerbates the drivers of child marriage, and I'll reflect more on that in a moment that it disrupts access to essential sexual and reproductive rights and health services and undermines health systems that are fundamental to upholding um, society and, and maintaining a functional society and, and well-being in people's health. And also, with extreme weather events and disasters brought on by climate change, we see all of those negative impacts on sexual and reproductive rights and health as well. Uh, and there's a number of, of, ex of examples of those. So fundamentally, we see climate change increasing inequality and vulnerability, and particularly for groups who are facing intersecting forms of oppression. Um, so one of the ways that we started to unpack the way that these different intersections and evidence bases are coming together was by reviewing 50 uh, documents related to the nationally determined contributions for climate change. And this review was undertaken in partnership with Queen Mary University, where I work, but also with the United Nations Population Fund. And what we did is we looked at 50 NDCs and we reviewed them across a number of thematic areas. So we looked at gender, we looked at health, we looked at population dynamics, we looked at references to rights, and we looked at references to vulnerable populations. And what we found was not very many references directly to sexual and reproductive rights and health, which is maybe unsurprising, there was six. But what we did find was that that with the combination of these thematic areas, sexual and reproductive rights and health was essentially underpinning so many of the other uh, important elements that were captured inside the NDC reviews. So we saw 36 references to gender, we saw a number of references to human health, but a lot of these references were quite superficial. They lacked depth and they lacked sort of real understanding of the ways that coming, th things were coming together for people on the ground. And with, by, by looking at it in the way that we did across these different thematic areas, it was really clear that the, sort of at the linchpin of a lot of these different thematic areas was sitting sexual and reproductive rights and health. So we encourage um, greater inclusion of SRHR inside NDCs <coughs> and more meaningful inclusion in climate policy across the board based on this review. Um, so a lot of what I just said is reflected in these points here. Um, but what we know is that SRHR services are fundamental to health and fundamental to strengthening, strengthening health system resilience to climate change. We also see uh, linkages between the climate crisis and other environmental crises. So, you know, we also see increasing data coming out on the role of toxins, on the waste crisis, on the pollution crisis, on the biodiversity crisis, and how all of these things interlock to actually create uh, more vulnerability for people, but also impact people's sexual and reproductive rights and health. We hear anecdotes about people who are needing to use different kinds of pesticides because of changes in weather and changes in crop formation and are having impacts on their fertility, their menstruation and onwards as a result. You know, uh, we, we're reading about the impacts of these things on people's fertility as well. So actually taking a broad view of all environmental crises is something that we, we also see as important in um, advancing our research in this area. Um, we also did a review, a, a, a literature review, a scoping review on the relationship between climate change and child marriage. And what we found is that climate change exacerbates the existing drivers of child marriage. So we see you know, disasters and extreme weather events putting pressure on families um, and you know, needing to find ways to cope. We see, that, uh, we see marriages as a way of potentially reducing financial pressure on families and securing more resources for them. We see uh, post-disaster settings um, in efforts to protect, potentially protect girl children, you know, looking to marriages to avoid threatened sexual violence or violence in post-disaster settings. We also see major disruptions to girls' education, um, and that can also, is also related to increases in child marriage. And we have also seen some evidence of a link between um, it, it, the increases in child marriage coming from climate disasters being related to female genital cutting and other harmful practices. 
And this, this is forthcoming um, in, a, in an evidence brief and also a, a published academic paper. So going forward, uh, I guess what we want to say is the evidence is coming. We're learning more and more about the ways that climate change comes together with sexual and reproductive rights and health, and we are seeing the development of an evidence base to make those intersections clear. But we, we do need more evidence, and we also need more ethics. There's been a lot of historical focus in this area on family planning um, as a potential solution to climate change, but we actually think a, a broader view of the whole range of sexual and reproductive rights and health and how that's impacted by climate change is important. Um, we see this range of environmental crises uh, impacting SRHR. And I guess um, maybe there's some of you in the audience today who work on gender. We often talk about gender and SRHR together, which makes a lot of sense, but also we need SRHR impacts to be, to be made explicit. Um, sexual rights also are lacking in focus and understanding. There's kind of more and more evidence coming out on reproductive health, but we don't want to forget about sexual health and sexual rights in the equation so that we are looking and reflecting on the whole range of sexual and reproductive rights and health. And perhaps finally, what we want to say is uh, building a culture of radical consent all the way through. So in the way that we take on policies and the way that we enact and talk about sexual and reproductive rights and health in the climate change space should also reflect our values. And the actions that we take you know, should reflect the kind of world that we want to build to solve these multiple crises together. And uh, the reproductive justice movement, um, which has done quite a lot of work on maybe looking at some of the historical injustices that have been related to bringing together issues of reproduction in the environment. And we have a lot to also learn from, from that movement and work together with that movement to bring this conversation forward. So I'll end it there and hopefully look forward to questions. And I will pass this clicker down to Bipu. Thank you very much, Heather. Um, you highlighted the evidence there so clearly, and you really unpacked that sexual reproductive health and rights underpin so many of the commitments that have been made, but in doing so, it needs to be in our solutions. And we need this to be um, sexual reproductive health and rights in its full. Um, so we're now gonna move the discussion from the research and the evidence into the global policy space. And we're going to invite Mara Dolan, who is, who is the Program and Advocacy Associate at WeDo, to kind of speak to how we can frame these issues um, within the international community and how we can bring these recommendations to COP26 this year. So Mara co-authored the issue brief on climate justice and SRHR, which was developed by the Women and Gender Constituency and the SRHR and Climate Justice Coalition. So Mara, I'll hand over to you, thank you. Thanks all, um, can you hear me okay? Okay, great. I don't have any slides prepared, so sorry. You'll just have to listen to me talk. Um, my name is Mara, I use she, her pronouns. I work with We Do, um, but like many feminists, projects and, and work that is done here at COP and everywhere around the world, it is, it is done in collective. And so I'm really proud of this brief that I'm going to speak about, but I also really think it's important to foreground the fact that it was an extremely collaborative project and that lots of folks worked on it. And some are here, some are here in this space at COP and many are not. Um, many voices are missing from, from COP and many voices have been excluded. And I, I'm gonna return to that in a moment in terms of thinking about um, the work of feminist advocacy that is happening in this global policy space and feminist advocacy that is happening around SRHR specifically. Um, so the Women and Gender Constituency, which you just heard me mention, um, is one of the nine stakeholder groups of civil society under the UNFCCC. We advocate together here at COP and beyond, bringing together women's rights organizations, feminist organizations, and grassroots women-led groups all around the world to be thinking about the ways that we can really work together to center human rights, gender justice, indigenous sovereignty, bodily autonomy, a whole set of feminist demands that really understand that we need a transformation of our economic, political, and social system to actually address the climate crisis and the things that underpin it, which we all know are white supremacy, patriarchy, colonialism, uh, and extractivism. So the Women and Gender Constituency, or the WGC for short, uh, is a network, and there are lots of folks here. You'll probably see us wearing these masks. 
If you want one after this, you can come up um, to myself or one of my colleagues in the crowd who you see with these masks on and, and grab one. They are part of our color campaign that is happening throughout COP that is aligned, each, each day is aligned with one of our demands. Um, and they range from everything around um, sticking to 1.5 and really honoring the ways that uh, 1.5 degrees, keeping to 1.5 degrees is a matter of solidarity, uh, is a matter of solidarity for, for our kin and our sisters and our brothers and our siblings in small island developing states. We have feminist demands around um, listening to youth leadership, to honoring human rights and saying no to false solutions. Um, and many more. So if you're interested in our color campaign, please come get masks. But all of that is to say that the Women and Gender constituency is really interested in understanding, building evidence, and, and really resourcing folks to better understand the ways that gender justice and climate justice are deeply, deeply interconnected. And one of those, as folks have been speaking to, is really understanding the ways that bodily autonomy, uh, reproductive justice, sexual health and rights are, are a part of the ways that we are building a world um, that is in response to the climate crisis and a world in which folks actually have the resources that they need, they are healthy, they are cared for, they are safe, and they're able to live lives that are free from um, pollutants, the health impacts that come with the cli climate crisis, and have clean air, clean water, the right to land, and, and food sovereignty. So, the SRHR brief, um, the SRHR and climate justice brief that was developed by the Women and Gender Constituency and a new coalition known as the SRHR and Climate Justice Coalition, which was launched at the Generation Equality Forum earlier this year and brought together um, SRHR focused groups and climate focused groups to really be thinking about how to continue building resources and evidence and advocacy materials at this intersection for spaces like COP, but also beyond. Um, this brief was the first, the first resource developed by that collaboration. And part of that brief um, is really about first naming why a human rights-based framework is so critical. And here I just wanna pause and also really underscore the importance here of understanding the history that this brief is stepping into and understanding that um, for much of the conversation around climate change and reproductive rights, it was deeply rooted and embedded in white supremacy. And it was deeply rooted and embedded in population control narratives that targeted and violated the human rights of women of color and women in the global south. So as a white woman and as white women working on SRHR, I think that's really important to name because if we do not have a social justice based framework around SRHR and climate, a human rights based framework, we are not moving away from that narrative when we need to be deeply shutting it down and moving into, into a human rights-based framework as the only one that is acceptable. So I'm gonna quickly actually just touch on the five demands that this brief talks about. Um, and these are the demands that the SRHR and Climate Justice Coalition and the WGC highlighted for this COP, but also are really laying the, the groundwork to be thinking about what are ways that global climate policy spaces can be thinking about these intersections in the future and really starting to build out the text and the resources and the mechanisms to support this work into the future in the many spaces, locally, nationally, and globally that climate policy is being developed, right? So one of those is, is what I just touched on. The first uh, recommendation is really applying a human rights and social justice-based framework and approach to climate action that includes the full range of SRHR. And this is really you know, using that text in the Paris Agreement that foregrounds our right to health, the, right, the rights of indigenous peoples, local communities, migrants, children, persons with disabilities, and people in vulnerable situations, um, as well as gender equality, really using that language of the Paris Agreement to understand how SRHR fits into that um, as part of our approach um, that is human rights based. Our second demand and recommendation for folks at COP and beyond is really committing <coughs> robust and feminist financing to this intersection. Um, as folks have spoken to, it's been so under-resourced. Um, and the more evidence, the more testimonies, the more voices who are able to really be speaking to the ways that this is lived and experienced in their communities, in their context, the stronger policy we can build to actually address needs, right? So we need that robust financing. Uh, we want to ensure that SRHR is really integrated into specific UNFCCC 
gender action plan activities, um, which of course provides a very clear existing pathway to integrate gender perspectives into climate action. And through that roadmap that exists within the gap, of course, which next year we will have a full review of, SRHR needs to be deeply integrated into all of those pieces because as you mentioned, gender cannot be assumed to also include SRHR, it needs to be explicitly named. Fourth, we really want to encourage the engagement of girls and women in all their intersecting identities and youth and gender focused organizations in these climate processes. Um, nothing without us, uh, nothing for us without us, right? If we're gonna be talking about SRHR, we need to be having the voices who are really the leaders on SRHR advocacy, which uh, for generations have been queer folks, women, girls, non-binary folks, really thinking about bodily autonomy and, and their needs. Um, and fifth and last, continue raising awareness on the intersections between climate and SRHR, right? Um, I think a lot of folks are in this room because they're probably curious what this intersection really means. Uh, what are the things that we can be thinking about at it and how, how, does, how does this intersection really, how is it lived? Um, and so I think the more narrative tools, um, the more testimonies that are really amplified, the more awareness th there is around this intersection, um, resources will follow, action will follow, and ambition will be seen. So those are five of the demands that are in the SRHR and climate justice and women and gender constituency issue brief. You can find that on the women and gender constituency website. Um, and I will wrap up there to pass on to the folks who are going to give much more interesting testimony around what this advocacy looks like um, in action. But I do wanna lift up that resource if folks are thinking about meeting with negotiators, um, speaking with their own communities, what are the ways that these demands can really be seen in global policy spaces like COP? Thanks all. Thank you, Mara. Um, yeah, please do check out the issue brief and thank you for highlighting the way that these demands are underpinned by this social justice and human rights framework, which is so important to everything we are discussing today. So as Mara um, stated there, we are gonna now move on to some testimonies and we're gonna look at programs on the ground and we're gonna hear from um, specific perspectives. So we're gonna move on now to hear from Zainab Yunusu. And she's gonna speak to the intersection between the climate crisis and sexual reproductive health rights as a youth activist from Nigeria. She also sits on the UNFPA Joint Youth Working Group and she works at Plan International's Youth Movements and Campaigns Coordinator. She's coordinating work to champion girls' voices, power and leadership for gender equality. So Zainab, over to you, thank you. Um, thank you very much for the platform. It's always interesting to be able to share what is happening <laughs> from my perspective and coming from Nigeria to the world and hopefully that um, we can replicate some of this in some other places. So for me, it's just going to build on what um, the two speakers before me, what they have mentioned about the interlinkages between sexual reproductive health and, and climate change. And I, I think for me, the journey started in um, 2019 when there was the symposium on um, sexual reproductive health and climate change and gender. It was organized by UF, UNFPA in, in, in South Africa then. So it, it's for the advocacy, like they have all said, it starts with, with research because it's almost like you cannot demand for anything without data, without research to, to back your demands. And this, this it, it happened that the interlinkages between sexual reproductive health and climate change was grossly understudied. So one of the advocacy move was like, we're going to um, increase research in this area. So, so I remember at that meeting, there were academicians, there, there were uh, people from uh, practitioners, development practitioners, there were people, there were young representatives. I was there as a young representative of the UNFCCC youth constituency there. And it was, it was an interesting gathering because we were able to hear and this was like, this was a diverse group, people from different countries working in different backgrounds, these interlinking backgrounds. So there was this consultation, we were able to make a draft of um, input recommendations, ways that we think that we can amplify this issue and create more, um, more noise per se about what they what they are and how they interlink and how they affect each other each other and I remember one key thing from that uh, meeting was where um, 
one of the study that um, Heather, what, that she presented here. So coming up with facts, being able to study, um, research how, how these linkages with actual figures and happenings in some, in some respective places. So I think that, that is something I can share on in terms of, in terms of research. And then in terms of advocacy, what 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 we're now what we now shifted to was more like okay there, there there is progress already going on in terms of research how can we get how can we get at country level to to make sure that sexual reproductive health is seen as is seen is recognized as a climate adaptation strategy and so one thing we did in nigeria was my team and i one thing we did in nigeria was that when it, it happened to be that nigeria recently was um, enhancing the nationally determined contribution so at that time so what we did was to organize a youth consultation actually and and we, we were able to get the buy-in of the ministry of um, environment there in nigeria and luckily for us, the, the minister is someone that is very passionate and interested mostly in issues as it concerns young people and girls. So we, we were able to um, organize this virtual um, consultation where there was about 280 young people. They were very interested in different aspects of the NDC. And one of the, one of the working areas, one of the themes that we touched on was gender. And I remember most of the inputs um, among the inputs that we made in, in, that, in that draft of recommendation, it was specifically hitting on sexual reproductive health and rights. And some of this contribution came from myself and my colleague, Chia Goze, then that we attended that symposium. So because we already got this knowledge from the symposium that we attended, we were like, okay, there, there are ways that we can link sexual reproductive health, putting it at the center as an important aspect that can fall under um, adaptation strategy, which can then feed into the national, uh, nationally determined contributions that Nigeria is working on. So that was part of what we put in as a youth um, recommendation that we submitted to the Ministry, Ministry of Environment. Well, we didn't, really, we didn't clearly get it there in there stated, but it's something that it, it has created a sort of awareness and by, with, with what is going on in COP, with dialogue sessions like this, it's something that I'm sure that when we go back, when we return, and then we give this feedback to say, you know what, sexual reproductive health is something that was, it was big in this scope, and they're now trying to, peep, many practitioners, many organizations are understanding the interlinkages, and they're saying, we want to say this is, we want, we want to make this a recognized um, adaptation strategy. So that is one aspect of it. And then in terms of um, um, an advo advocacy, another perspective is, so I, I like, like she introduced, I belong to a, U, a joint youth working group of UNFPA. So it's a joint youth working group on sexual reproductive health and rights and climate change. So one of the things that we, in as much as there's the research going on, there's trying to put, uh, to recognize SRHR in the, um, in, the, in, the, in the NDCs of countries, there is also, there is also a need to talk about financing because, because one, one of the demands is that when, when it's recognized in the, in the NDCs, I mean, you need money to be able to implement whatever beautiful um, um, recommendations is put there in any of the action plans. So in terms, of, in terms of financing, it's also, and I think it's also one of the, the key things for me at this COP, to be able to see organizations that work in this, um, in this area to actually demand for specific, um, specific figure of, of funding. I mean, we know that there's still the, the struggle, the push for 50-50 um, adaptation and mitigation um, funding. So how about we say, okay, if we're facing, if we want SRHR to be recognized as um, a, a specific adaptation strategy, how about we demand for figures? I mean, let's, let's air it out first and see what, what we're going from there. Should we say, oh, maybe 0.5%? Are we saying 1% of whatever adaptation funding that we're getting for financing? That, so that we're not just um, making noise and having it written in paper, but we also have um, money, we also have funds, finance, to push projects back home that, that can strengthen health system. 
that, that will then directly benefit these women, these girls that are in this front line that are being affected by the impact of climate change in their communities, in their environment, in, in stopping them from um, education, girls from going to school, girls from being able to, to access um, contraceptives, um, unintended pregnancies. You know, we have to be able to translate these. So that is another aspect of advocacy that I find very interesting. And that's why the aspect of climate finance, financing is also something that we as a group, as a youth um, um, working group, will also try to push on and make noise about and say, okay, you know what, we need, this is important in what we're doing. So there, there are different ways to go about the advocacy, there are different methods, but like I've mentioned, research, finance, um, nationally determined contributions, these are beautiful strategies to go about it. Mm. Thank you so much, Zainab. You hit on something really important there, and that's how do we move from this rhetoric to action and to commitment? So how do we move just purely from these, these recommendations and how do we overcome these barriers and put the financing in place? And I think that's something really important that we can perhaps pick up on again in our Q&A session at the end. So thank you so much. Um, so we're gonna once again move from the global to the local and from policy to programs. And we're now here from Mia Nielsen of DFPA on how the DFPA's programs are building bridges between the work on the climate crisis and on SRHR at different levels. So the DFPA addresses these linkages um, through innovation, creating, they've recently created a project named WORTH, the Women's Earth Initiative, which Mia project manages, and she will speak to um, the impact of this project on the ground. So Mia, over to you. Thank you, Emily. Um, at DFPA, we have been working with these interlinkages since uh, two, uh, 2009. It has uh, largely been based upon global advocacy work in spaces like the COP, but it's also, as Emily also said, it's also built upon programmatic partnerships with uh, East Africa and Southeast Asia as well. Um, what we have learned throughout the years is, as Heather also briefly touched upon, is that there really is a lack of evidence uh, looking at the programmatic side of this. So we at DFA saw this uh, missing evidence and we wanted to, to build upon that. And that's one of the reasons why we created WORTH together with our partners, Arrow. Um, so WORTH was uh, created because we wanted to build a, a more stable evidence base, but it was also built because we wanted to support uh, the establishment of local-led projects as well as capacity sharing between civil society organizations um, from countries who are at the forefront of experiencing the consequences from uh, these devastating uh, climate, changing, uh, climate changes. Um, so what it concretely does is that it invites CSO representatives from these countries to participate in first an e-course that explains the sexual and reproductive health and rights, environmental sustainability, climate change, and all of the interlinkages between these. And that's because we invite both uh, civil society organizations from both uh, the gender equality and SRH spheres, but we also uh, invite people from environment and the climate um, sphere as well. So we need to build that common bridge and invite them all together to talk about these uh, interlinkages. Um, after they are taking part in this e-learning course, we invite them to be a part of a learning lab that spans across three days where we will introduce them to a range of different tools that can support them in capacity sharing and uh, identify the challenges that are uh, in between these two silos that are definitely needed to be um, addressed in a more united manner. But uh, the challenges that they find themselves are the most relevant in their context that address the interlinkages between SRH and climate change. After that, they can uh, use the tools to find innovative solutions to address these challenges, and then they go back home to the local context where they get to field test these ideas. Then they come back for learning lab number two where they can tweak and refine these solutions based on what they found out when they field tested the solutions. And after that, they can apply for a small grant through WORTH where they can um, get a chance to implement the solution in the local context. Um, and what, is, what I find is um, 
the greatest thing about Worth and the most inspiring thing is that we really let it be completely up to the representatives which challenges they want to address, which they found uh, the most important, the most relevant, and how they want to address these uh, challenges with which solutions, which often actually leads to the full, the expiration of the full SRHR agenda and not just contraception or family planning. Um, and I also briefly want to touch upon what can be the challenging part of administrating a project like Worth, because Heather and Mara also talked about that part, which is finding the funding, because it is quite challenging uh, to uh, fundraise for a project like Worth because much of the funding is already allocated into two silos of either climate or HHR. So for our project and other projects that are in between these two chairs, it's quite hard to actually find funding. So we keep trying to educate uh, donors and funds about both the interlinkages between SRHR and climate change, but absolutely also on how challenging it can be to administrate a project like Worth, which is a very much a shame because it also leads to there being less evidence and then it's going to be this bad circle as Mara also touched upon. So um, that was a bit about how DFPA <coughs> Is, uh, is working with the interlinkages between climate change and SRHR. Thank you so much, Mia. Um, so we're now gonna go to Bipu, who's actually going to build on this and explain a bit more about the impacts of the Worth Initiative, um, specifically within the Asia region. So Bipu is the program director at Arrow, so the partner organization for the Worth Initiative. And we're also going to um, have some video interventions which highlight the stories of several Worth project grantees in Bangladesh, Pakistan, and the Philippines. So Bipu, over to you. Thank you. Thanks to all the speakers who went before me because that really sets the context of what I'm going to present. As part of Arrow's work on this interlinkages, what we have done is we have done scoping studies in various countries in uh, Asia. And what I'm going to present is some of the findings of these uh, uh, scoping studies that we have done in different countries in Asia. Asia. So, um, so the, this is the context that we are in, especially in the region. Asia-Pacific region is at the forefront of experiencing uh, the impact of climate change and its related disasters. And in many countries in the region are located at the top of the most vulnerable countries in the uh, world. Uh, climate change has resulted in more frequent and extreme weather events. And countries like Indonesia, Philippines, Bangladesh, um, India, Pakistan are especially vulnerable to these extreme um, events. And according to the estimates uh, that was uh, done by ESCAP Asia Pacific, the Asia Pacific region has its annual loss of $675 billion due to climate induced disasters. And the ramifications of climate change also impact food security and trigger conflicts over uh, key resources. Um, so the as we all know, the impact of climate change is not gender neutral. And one of the many disproportionate impact of climate change is on women, girls, and non-binary people in, that include the uh, lack of uh, access to sexual and reproductive health and rights. And these impacts are actually a manifestation of gender inequality and lack of SIHR priorities, especially for women, girls, and non-binary people, which is only exacerbated by gender uh, blind climate uh, solutions. So, uh, so these are the, these are the like you know the reports that we have done. Um, they actually are the scoping uh, studies that we have done since 2014. And like you know, there are some countries that we have done some studies in recently as well. And I'll share some findings from these as well. So, um, and these are the stories of the women. Actually, it's on the screen. You might not able, be able to see it now, but like you know, uh, if you go to our website, you'll be able to see all the stories, the stories of women that was told by women. So, and I'll just give you some examples from the countries. For example, in Maldives, uh, the healthcare services are not available in all islands because it's an island country, right? And for women living in the outlying islands where SIH services are not available, they have to actually travel to another island that, of, uh, that offers these services and even to find a gynecologist, right? However, during the harsh weather conditions, sea level, uh, sea travel is unsafe and, in many, in, and sometimes it's even impossible, right? And this often uh, results in pregnant women uh, with either pregnancy or like you know 
the delivery complications, uh, being unable to access timely health services. Similarly, we have a case in Pakistan, um, a Pakistani woman in the Sindh province who had more difficulty in seeking sexual and reproductive health service compared to men during displacement due to two reasons. One is the unavailability of women doctors in the camps or shelters, and secondly, <coughs> women are not allowed to leave the temporary shelter on their own to access health services. And these also attribute to cultural practice and uh, strict uh, like male dominance uh, in the province. And we also have stories from Nepal. When climate extreme events happen, oftentimes young girls are among the first to be affected to the extent that they are forced to drop out of schools. And the increasing workload in the household and economic hardships experienced by these families would cause parents to withdraw their daughters from the schools. What happens with this is because, uh, what happens with this is um, they, are, um, they are not able to access comprehensive sexuality education, some of, some of the components which are actually provided in the schools. And again, as Heather mentioned, um, the climate uh, events can also exacerbate the phenomenon of um, early child, uh, early marriages, especially for girls. And we have actually our uh, partners in Bangladesh and, uh, and Nepal. They found in the studies that families are actually practicing uh, child marriage among young daughters as a means to escape poverty brought about by climate crisis. And this, these are happening even in the countries um, that has banned early child marriage. So, um, so I mean, like, you know, if you look at the national landscape and policies, so these are the actually the studies that we did recently uh, with support from UN Women. Um, that the, if you look at the policy landscape on gender, climate, and disaster risk, it's very diverse, it's, it, and it's like you know, it's not, it's very focused on top-down approach. Um, so, in national policy frameworks, key gender-specific issues such as sexual and reproductive health. Uh, health and rights, as well as disability and gender-based violence, they get skipped very easily from planning processes and often they have to be traded off with competing priorities. And I, we see that happening in the negotiations as well. So we have also study from Cambodia that has found that technical documents and strategies for gender mainstreaming at policy level are inadequate and the ones that exist do not have sufficient practice, practical information. Also in Vietnam, the policy processes are not backed by evidence-based um, ad advocacy that uh, Zainab was talking about earlier. So in all this, what is also happening is the representation of women in the negotiation spaces or representation, uh, representation of women and uh, women uh, Girls, as well as like you know the non-gender, uh, gender non-binary uh, people, they are missing in all the decision-making and policy-making spaces. So it is due, it is like you know duty to this context in the region. Our focus on SHR uh, in the context of climate change is even more crucial, and the looking at that inter in linkages is even more important. And if you are looking at, if you are seeking sustainable development and solution to climate, uh, climate crisis, it cannot be achieved without universal access to uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights. It is therefore important for us to keep finding innovative solutions uh, to these uh, challenges. And Ari is very happy to be part of the Worth Initiative um, that uh, Mia was just discussing uh, from the very inception uh, uh, phase um, in, in partnership with uh, Danish Family Planning Association. And Worth stands for Women and Earth Initiative. And you can actually like you know, look at our website as well. If you uh, type Women and Earth Initiative, you will find uh, more details of Worth. Uh, so we have to really start from building perspective as well as awareness on this nexus and then work on the policy levels to ensure that climate related policies are gender mainstreamed and SHR friendly. So it is now my pleasure to actually introduce the worth grantees um, in the screen that you can see we have uh, 14 of them over the last three years who were selected to implement the ideas on the nexus of climate crisis. And they pitch, as Mia was saying, they, they pitch their ideas during the, the, during the lab they went through. Uh, and the lab that we are talking about is a process, it's a de design thinking process where they hone their ideas, innovative ideas. So to learn about the work of all these grantees, again, I invite you to visit our virtual exhibition uh, that you will, if you, I mean, I'm, I'm sure all of you have an access to the of platform, so we have a virtual exhibition there. You have you learn more about their work on the ground in, on, on that platform. But uh, for this session, we have a video intervention uh, from four of our grantees, and uh, they are uh, Danica uh, from the Philippines. She will talk about her project Cookie Jar. Also from the Philippines is Vivian. She will talk about her project uh, Women Managed Area, 
And we also have Samreen Khan Gauri from Pakistan, who'll talk about her project Media Mall, and also Shababa from Bang uh, Bangladesh, who'll talk about her project Walk the Talk. So I'll let the, let the video talk, and uh, can we have the video, please? I am Danica Marie Supnet from the Institute for Climate and Sustainable Cities in the Philippines. Our Worth Initiative project is a series of capacity building and planning workshops to mainstream gender and sexual reproductive health and rights in the annual and long-term climate responsive development plans of the local government of Kiwan in the province of Eastern Samar. We were able to identify and include in the plans specific gender and SRHR responsive adaptation measures to open the cookie jar their gender fund, which was tapped as one of the local climate finance source to implement these measures starting next year 2022. We did this through the photo voice and photo gallery activities as an innovative means of planning that bridged the gap between the realities on the ground depicted by the photos and adaptation measures that need to be planned and implemented. Further, the innovation continued with the integrated analysis approach of combining the methodologies of the climate risk assessment, rapid care analysis, and adaptive social protection to deepen the community assessment on gender and SRHR issues aggravated by the creeping impacts of climate change, which is commonly lacking in the usual climate development plans. Despite the challenges of the pandemic, local government planning doesn't stop. The Worth Initiative project has contributed in this mandated policy and empowered not only Gewan's local planning team, but also the community members. These innovations are adopted by Gewan to be their methodology for their next planning cycle. And we hope to replicate these experiences with other local governments as well. This is Samreen Khan Kauri from Chalchal Participatory Organization, Pakistan. My project Media Molds for Women and SRHR in Climate Change aims to work with media that can play an instrumental role to address the issue of a lack of understanding and awareness rising about the relation of uh, SRHR and climate change. This project gives an amazing result while we are seeing that how our multimedia outlets from a, a local to national level um, become more attentive and supportive in terms of giving um, uh, in-depth and more frequent coverage, especially uh, young journalists who become advocate of the issue, not just uh, because of the uniqueness of the topic, but there are so many untold stories and prospective they want to keep learning, keep exploring and showcasing. And uh, there is very interesting fact that this pandemic phase actually helped to uh, bring limelight on this emerging topic uh, when at this time we are, uh, we are witnessing that uh, SRHR services uh, uh, unavailability and uh, lack of access, especially gender-based violence on rise and uh, vulnerability while handling climate and this health crisis. And this is the major learning of a world program that uh, how to bring possibilities and doing things differently in very resourceful and progressive manners uh, beyond all the limitations and challenges. And uh, now we learn, we achieved, and we carrying it forward. Hi, my name is Shababa Hawk. I'm from Dhaka, Bangladesh. I'm representing the International Center for Climate Change and Development, which is also based in Dhaka. Um, so I took part in the Worth Innovation Lab in the year 2020, and the Worth Innovation Lab for me was one of the most incredible platforms and a really wonderful experience. The lab not only taught us about the interlinkages between climate change and SRHR issues of women and girls, but it also taught me how to think out of the box, how to think more creatively, and how to develop um, more innovative solutions to the problems that I already see and know. And once we were done with that, it helped us um, develop those like creative solutions into actual projects. It taught us how to pitch for things, how to develop projects, how to do a storyboard, and um, all these incredible things that made our vision into something more tangible and something more possible and implementable. And it was an incredible um, process overall, and I'm really grateful for the conveners and the whole model that they designed. 
Um, so the project that I pitched was called Walk the Walk. Um, so the idea behind that was to take the user on a journey, uh, walk the walk, of a girl, woman or a girl in coastal Bangladesh and to understand how the impacts of climate change are affecting their sexual and reproductive health. And so we're doing that by developing a web-based gaming tool where we have three interactive fiction stories that you can select. And once you select a story, you get to walk the walk of the woman or girl that you've selected and to see how at different stages um, the impacts of climate change are making their reproductive and sexual health situation worse and so on. And then you get to make some decisions for them. And based on those decisions, you can see how their life turns out to be. And we're looking forward to um, university students playing the game first and to see their reaction to it and um, hopefully creating some change. Hi, I'm Vivian Fakunla from the Philippines and I'm working with PATH Foundation Philippines Incorporated. My project is about Women Managed Area is a Right. It focused on environmental sustainability, climate change adaptation, and sexual and reproductive health and rights. But prior to the implementation of my project, Worth Initiative provided a platform where we can exercise our creativity and think of ways on how we can promote gender equality, um, environmental sustainability, climate change adaptation, and sexual and reproductive health and rights through their uh, innovation lab program. So after the program, I applied for the Worth Initiative Fund to convert my ideas uh, into reality. And so I targeted uh, two indigenous people's communities women fishers communities in Calamianes Island Group, Philippines. Uh, since IP women, uh, they are the ones who have no opportunity to manage resources, to decide, to participate, or to exercise their rights. Through the support of Worth Initiative Fund, those women were able to establish their own women managed area. They were able to develop their management plans incorporating the sexual and reproductive health and rights. Uh, we're able to train more than 100 IP women fishers on gender sensitivity, fisheries management, um, uh, mangrove conservation, and of course sexual and reproductive health and rights. Right now, the concept uh, was already replicated in the two communities in Koron and in Apakan. So my experience with Worth Initiative, which started from the lab program up to the implementation of the project, was truly empowering and inspiring, not only with the communities that I've worked with, but for myself as well. Um, thank you, Bipo, for um, amplifying those stories. And it's incredible to see the innovation and the creativity that can underpin the solutions for equality and for sexual reproductive and health rights and climate adaptation. Um, so thank you to all our panelists for your presentations and bold messages thus far. And we're gonna use the remaining time to open up a space for discussion and dialogue um, with the audience and our panelists. Um, and that's crucial for building our understanding and for building the movement. So I'd like to start by asking the audience for any questions for our panelists or to share your own reflections on this topic from your own experience, your own organizations or your regions. Um, so if you'd like to raise your hand, if you have a question or reflection and um, you can please introduce your um, name and organization and we can direct you towards one of our two mics we've got at the side of the audience here. So please feel free to raise your hands for any questions or reflections. At the front here, yeah. There's a mic at the side if you'd like to. Um, do, you, do I need a mic? If you'd like to. No, it's just a question. Uh, there was a mention about the national design contributions and how many of them have taken policy. Um, if you could please take the mic, sorry, just so it can be heard on the stream. Thank you. Do you want me to go there? <laughs> No, uh, the question was about uh, the national uh, determined contributions, and the, I think that Heather made a reference, um, and also other uh, m other of you made reference about whether those uh, policies, adaptation policies, already had 
the issues of SHR um, in it. Do you have one? Do you have the numbers of the? I think you mentioned something, here, but do you have the regions where there is any difference between different regions? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, and I think I'll point the audience to two resources. So Women Deliver did a review of <coughs> national adaptation plans for references to sexual and reproductive rights and health. So if you'd like to look at an analysis of where SRHR is reflected in national adaptation plans, there's that resource. And then there's the analysis we did with Queen Mary and United Nation Population Fund, which looked at 50 uh, nationally determined contribution doc related documents and explored those for a range of references, um, including SRHR. So I wouldn't say that, uh, we looked at five regions of the world, I wouldn't say that with that, that we were able to see kind of trends, especially as there was only six direct references to sexual reproductive rights and health. Those included around maternal health, gender-based violence, family planning, and HIV, and HIV in the context of whether or not you'd have the nutrition to be able to make the HIV medications work effectively. Uh, so those were the types of direct references we were seeing to SRHR, but when you do read those documents together and you're looking at health, you're looking at gender, you're looking at rights, you know, you're looking at uh, the kind of number of domains that we looked at, you really start to see the way things work together. So, so very interesting dimension for me, having the top view, was looking at things like the role of women and, and actually how something like energy transitions really relates to sexual and reproductive rights and health, which maybe is not the first thing that you would think of. But if you think that people are needing to travel further distances to collect firewood, to be able to cook, you know, they're out of school or productive activities, um, you know, maybe money making, whatever, during that time, they're traveling further from home, that can open them up to different kinds of forms of violence, the journeys are longer, like let's say you're heavily pregnant, you're making this very long journey, it's hard on your body and you know, on, on the pregnancy, then you're coming back and you're cooking, air pollution in the home, and so you don't necessarily think of something like an energy saving cook stove as an SRHR intervention, but actually when you actually look at all of these things together, you can start to draw the links and say, oh wow, something like that is actually also transformative to somebody's sexual and reproductive rights and health. And that was the benefit in our analysis of looking at uh, the number of thematic areas and going very deep into the references, but also being able to look for the top line overview. So I would say that there wasn't regional themes, but you could start to see themes like that. You know, themes like, oh wow, energy. Okay, how are we gonna think about, uh, about that in regards to SRHR, you know, or, or, or other dimensions as, as well. But I do point you to those two resources if you want to look at, you know, two important analyses of existing mainstream climate policy documents. Thank you very much, Heather. Do we have any other further questions from the audience? Yeah, we've got one over at the side there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Robin Maynard. I work for an organization called Population Matters. Uh, we have a program called Empower to Plan, which works with partner groups uh, at the grassroots in the global south, but also in rich developed countries like the UK, delivering sexual rights and reproductive health and addressing the lack of those. I totally get it that climate change exacerbates the absence and the unmet need for SRHR around the world. But I just wondered if the panelists had any thoughts about the lack of SRHR exacerbating climate change and being a solution and a mitigation. I think you touched on that. <coughs> I think you touched on that. You touched on that. So I'm happy, I'm happy to jump in here and say that we really strongly move away from seeing SRHR as a mitigation strategy at all. Um, that is really couched within what we understand to be the framework. Sorry, I was told not to hit my microphone. <laughs> I just did that. Um, that the framework of understanding population, um, the framework of understanding SRHR through mitigation in climate policy, climate action, climate planning, is deeply rooted in an understanding that we need to control women's bodies and how many children they are having, and that has always been deeply tied to white supremacy and colonialism and an understanding that it is um, population growth that is causing the climate crisis and not instead white countries, rich countries, global north countries, disproportionately extracting and utilizing absurd amounts of resources. So when we're thinking about 
understanding SRHR through a rights-based lens and understanding it as an adaptation and resilience strategy in terms of knowing that every person has the right to have a healthy and safe life in which their SRHR needs are met. Um, that is not a mitigation strategy. That is, that is a strategy around ensuring that folks have the resources that they need uh, to be resilient in the face of the climate crisis and helps us also see that um, addressing the climate crisis through really understanding who is extracting the most resources and is causing the most emissions and is really the small, small part of the world's population that lives in global north countries and and is hoarding most of the world's wealth and resources is responsible for the climate crisis. Thank you very much, Mara. And I think that just reiterates all of the really important conversations we've had today about the importance of like a rights-based lens and of it being a climate justice issue. So thank you for um, explaining that so clearly. We've got a question in the front, did I see there? Or was there any other questions? We have. Yes, this question there, thank you very much. I think before questioning, I would like to share something about India. And I think uh, the, what, what I wanted to share was that in India, around 30 sterilization camps were set up in Sargoja district, which is in Chhattisgarh. And 821 operations took place where women did not, I mean, they did not exactly consented to, you know, their wombs being removed. And in 2014, around 13 women died because of these uh, sterilization you know, that took place without their consent. So my question related to this is how do you tackle the situation in our geopolitical space where it is really hard to access these spaces and you know actually take up uh, you know intervene in those spaces and talk to women about SRHR. I can start. So um, again, like you know, I think I will build on what Mara just said. We really need to move away from the population control narrative. I mean, it's not a solution to climate change. Uh, that's that's the first thing, right? Um, so the sexual and reproductive health and rights, and I, I'm aware of this case. I actually wanted to share this, but that's that's the violation of sexual and reproductive health and rights, right? And we have that actually in the region. A lot of examples of how there are forced sterilizations, and in the not just in the context of climate change, also in the context of conflict, right? There are actually so many. Um, um, so of these policies that are imposed without realizing that, not without realizing, actually it's just a full-on disrespect, disrespect on the face of like, you know, women and their bodily autonomy and sexual and reproductive health and rights. So I think like, you know, um, I mean, it's really that to talk about the uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights, but also like spaces like this, right, where the negotiations are happening and that there are so many other spaces that, uh, to look at these issues, not in silos, but like you know, to, to look at these issues, the interlinkages, interlinking these issues are really important. But again, it goes to as basic as that. That was a crime. Like you know, it is uh, the sexual. It was a violation of sexual and reproductive health and rights, and the, like you know, the entire human rights of the um, women. Yeah. But I would. I think just to build on what the other two panelists have said, there, there are ways of doing these intersections wrong. And we have to make sure that if we're bringing these topic areas together, we're doing it in a way that doesn't result in reproductive injustices, but actually is something that genuinely supports resilience and adaptive capacity and um, you know, kind of builds, the way that we respond to these challenges needs to reflect the world we're also trying, trying to build. And so there aren't any shortcuts or any quick fix solutions or any instrumental or technocratic solutions around sexual and reproductive rights and health. It has to be the whole thing. It has to have radical consent. It has to have, you know, prioritize the voices of people who maybe aren't heard enough. And, and it, you know, family planning, for example, it's not a solution to climate change. We know what the, the big solutions to climate change are. We have to be careful that we don't instrumentalize anybody or their bodies in responding to the global crises we have. And urgency can be a very dangerous narrative. You know, we know that there's loads of urgency around the topics that we're describing in, in the comment you said just now and climate change in general. We can't let that enable mm -hmm. um, policies and practices that don't actually uphold our values and don't actually create, you know, the world that we really want to see, one that, you know, represents justice, represents radical consent, represents true well-being. So uh, there are ways that we can get these intersections wrong and we need to think about 
you know, how we bring them together, the discourses that we use, the narratives we employ. Thank you so much, Heather. And I think just as we're beginning to wrap up now, we've really touched on some important points about how we frame this intersection and about how we frame it going forward so that we can continue to build the movement in a way that's, that really brings about these commitments that we're talking about and brings about the action that we really want to see. So we've spoken a lot today about choice, about bodily autonomy, about structural transformation, inclusion and collaboration. And I think that's what we all want to celebrate and champion today through the many um, policy briefs and um, intersections we've spoken about and the programs we've seen on the ground with the Worth Initiative and the grantees we heard from in the video interventions. So our panelists have shared multiple examples of the way in which the climate crisis intersects with sexual reproductive health and rights and they've made a clear case for why sexual reproductive health and rights like the ability to make decisions over one's body, to have access to healthcare, and to be free from violence are critical to people's ability to adapt and to be resilient to the many adverse impacts that the climate crisis has on their lives. So today we're striving to build bridges between the sexual and reproductive health and rights and the climate change and adaptation debates, championing, championing a human rights and social justice based approach to climate action that includes the full range of SRHR. These innovative and integrated approaches are critical for advancing gender equality and for strengthening individual and community resilience and the capacity to adapt to the climate crisis. So our panelists have shown that we really need to go beyond just the what and to identify the how. And they've highlighted that these ambitious and inclusive and feminist solutions and entry points for SRHR in the climate policy arena, such as the gender action plans, the NDCs and disaster response plans through local and regional programs and projects um, are there. And we have the evidence and we have the movement behind us, but we need the structural transformation, the robust financing and the clear commitments to really bring these to the forefront and into action. So we really hope that after listening to our panelists today, that you will agree that with us that sexual and reproductive health and rights should be recognized as an essential element of climate change adaptation and resilience movements. So I'd like to um, all thank our panelists and the organizers today, and thank you all for joining both here in Glasgow and online. Thank you.